Hello and welcome to today's webcast, Put a Dent in Your CSO Event Using Structural HDPE, brought to you by Waterworld and sponsored by Upanor Infra. My name is Angela Godwin. I'm Chief Editor for Waterworld, and I will be your moderator today. A few housekeeping items before we begin. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We'll try to answer these during the live Q&A portion at the end of the webcast, but if we don't get to them, we will provide those to the speakers and they will answer you individually. You can expand the slide area in the center of your console by clicking on the Maximize icon at the top right of the slide window or by dragging the bottom right corner to enlarge it. In fact, you can expand and reposition many of the components you see on your screen, so please feel free to arrange them as you desire to give you the optimal webcast viewing experience. You'll find some useful resource materials available for download via the resource list widget, which looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. There you will also find a PDF of today's slide presentation. If you have any technical difficulties during the webcast, please click on the Help widget. It has a question mark icon and addresses some common technical issues. But if you still need assistance, just type your issue into the Q&A widget and a member of our webcast support team will work with you to correct the problem. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of the live event. A reminder email message will be sent out to all registrants with a link to that archive. It will also be accessible from our homepage at waterworld.com. One last thing to mention, the presenters will be issuing a certificate of attendance to all attendees within 48 hours of the conclusion of the webcast. We have two terrific presenters for you today. We have Grant Thornley, who is the Director of North American Sales for Upanor Infra. With 25 years of experience in the industrial, municipal, and power markets, Grant's area of expertise is in pipeline infrastructure rehabilitation, asset management, stormwater, wastewater management, water transmission, and condition assessment. And we also have Brian McGuire, PE. He's a manager of engineered systems in North America. He oversees product development, sales, marketing, engineering, and operations related to Upanor Infra's engineered system portfolio throughout the region. He's a licensed professional civil water resource engineer with over 20 years of experience in the civil construction materials industry. And now, without further ado, I will turn the program over to Grant. Great. Well, thank you very much, Angela. I appreciate that uh, introduction. And I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to push the slide here. There we are. Okay, I thought we would start um, very quickly with the agenda. Is, uh, we'll do a quick introduction of uh, who Upanor is. Uh, we'll get into a bit of the Waylight uh, introduction, an overview of our engineered systems, move into our CSO and, and stormwater applications, and then slowly move down into the benefits features, the engineering, and finally uh, application uh, ex examples of applications. To start off, <coughs> uh, to start off, who is Upanor Infra? Well, uh, we started back in 1918 uh, as a carpentry uh, workshop and really fabricating furniture, uh, beds and, and furniture. Uh, one of the aspects of our, our fabrication was we actually made the steel uh, bed springs. Uh, that fabrication of the steel bed springs evolved in 1938 to the manufacturing cast iron pipes, which is our first foray into the infrastructure market within Europe. Uh, later on, steel pricing uh, increasing within uh, Europe, uh, we expanded our portfolio to start producing PVC piping because of the economics of it. Continue the expansion uh, of our technologies as well as our market. Uh, we went into PEX piping. Uh, continued the the demand for infrastructure rehabilitation. Continued uh, in 1999, Upanor started to begin acquiring uh, several other companies, and one of the largest um, companies that we purchased uh, within the uh, pipe manufacturer was KWH, which a lot of people uh, knew us back then by. Uh, KWH is the, has specialized technologies as well as patents within the manufacturing of large diameter HDP pipe using a, a, um, a technology called uh, Waylight. 
Um, and today, uh, Upanor offers numerous uh, polymer solutions, and we have expanded beyond just uh, pipe uh, offerings for the infrastructure and now do uh, more solution offerings for um, stormwater, wastewater, but structural elements uh, offerings. So Upanor, just as a general, we're about a one point, uh, I'll convert that to euros to US, to about 1.1 billion uh, US. We operate within 30 countries. We have 14 uh, manufacturing facilities worldwide, as well as a couple in, in North America, and have over about 37,000 and 3,700 employees. Uh, Upanor is broken up into three sex uh, divisions, uh, Upanor Infra, uh, solutions, which uh, we represent, is about 30% of our operations, 45% is about in plumbing solutions, and 25% is indoor climate solutions, which are electronic controls for, for heating, uh, cooling, and, and so on. To understand, I mean, UFIN or INFRA are offerings within the North American market space, we can really break it into three, um, three families of three different types of products. One is you're probably familiar with our Sclare pipe, which is our solid wall HDPE, uh, high density polyethylene, uh, which allows us to go from small diameters, uh, about three inches, to about uh, 63 inches on the solid walls. And that allows us to go from lower pressures to very high pressures, over 200 PSI. The structural HDPE pipe, which was uh, a unique offering by KWH, is that allows us to do high volumes, but lower pressures. So it allows us to really look at the market space of what is the most economical offering to put forward, and that's we classify as our whaleite pipe. Uh, examples of the whaleite pipe would be in uh, gravity, uh, stormwater drains, as well as uh, using them in uh, hydroelectric for penstocks, um, the conveyance of uh, water or wastewaters. Uh, and lastly, our structural HTP panels really leverages the technology of the uh, the whaleite. Um, uh, understand, uh, I'm sorry, the technologies that we have and allows us to produce panels. The combination permutations of doing a solid wall to a structural um, whaleite pipe to the panels really allows us to um, go to the market and provide very unique um, solutions offerings out of the structural HTP that no other company uh, today offers within North America as well as Europe. So to start off with, the, the key component that we start off with is a box, uh, box beam um, structure, which is extruded out, out, out of our extruders. Uh, that's the, the, the base component of our Waylight uh, pipe as well as our, oh, I'm sorry, Waylight pipe as well as our Waylight panels. Um, just a quick diagram of this, and you can see one of the uh, Waylight pipes, if we were to weld that, um, uh, weld the box beam structures together, we can create uh, larger uh, sorry larger structures um, and roll that if we take the uh, box beam structure and put that onto a winder on a helical drum, we can wind that into a very large diameter pipe uh, or we can weld it just in a straight plane and produce uh, the wayo panel. So there's just two uh, pictorials of the raw materials that we're looking at. Uh, here's uh, one of the waylight pipes coming off of one of our production lines. Uh, this is a smaller one, but we can produce up to 14-foot uh, uh, diameters. Getting into the properties of, of HDPE, there's, there's different types, like anything from, from back in the 1920s to present day, you know, technologies evolved, and so has the chemistries within resins. Um, Upanor uses a bimodal resin, and simply put, what that is, it allows, it provides us a resin um, that has greater structural uh, properties than a unimodal that is commonly found in the market today. It provides greater structural integrity, uh, greater uh, resistance to crack propagation, better stress uh, ratings, and, and so on. Uh, the other aspect to Upanor, we don't use any regrinds or any filler in our materials, um, which allows us to have tight, very tight control uh, over the characteristics uh, of our products. Just to give you an understanding of HEP, um, some of the characteristics, which is a, the, the creep and stress relaxation, typically this pictorial here shows you that if we were to apply a, a strain uh, or force to the material, uh, it will react by elongating um, and trying to counteract those stresses. So in this particular instance, uh, over a long period of time, 
the material will um, uh, uh, compensate by, by stretching out to try to alleviate, uh, alleviate the stresses applied to it. That being said, that the, the material essentially has a memory. So when you release the stresses that have been applied, it typically goes back to its original form even after 50 years. So that is important, uh, an important aspect of the ATP material uh, because other rigid materials, you would develop uh, stress points and could uh, create um, st uh, stress fractures or cracks um, and essentially leak points. Oops, sorry about that. One of the other aspects to, to HTP is its chemical, uh, chemical inertness. Because it is an, uh, uh, an organic material, um, and the HTP principles, it's unaffected by acid and bases, so very, if we had pH swings from very low to very high, it's inert to those, uh, which is great for uh, wastewater treatment or chemical uh, uh, batch tanks, uh, or even uh, stormwater uh, systems, unaffected by hydrogen sulfide, particularly in the vapor space or on the crown of pipes, it's unaffected by that, unlike steel or concrete. And again, because it's not a uh, metallic material, it doesn't suffer the effects of corrosion. Uh, one of the important aspects when we, when we talk about stormwater applications, or CSOs, is the abrasion resistance uh, of, of HDPE. When we compare, whenever you have uh, particles impacting, um, uh, such as sand or silt, the rubbing or the impact of the solid upon the pipe structure's uh, surface result in abrasion. So here's a quick pictorial or graph of showing that when um, sand uh, or hard material impact concrete, the wear uh, or abrasion of that surface is quite rapid, whereas HDPE, because it is more of a flexible material, actually absorbs the energy uh, of those particles and less abrasion uh, occurs within those surfaces. And that's important with stormwater or CSO applications because you are passing through sand and silt uh, through, um, uh, through the surfaces. So those are just quickly some of the, the, the uh, characteristics of the HBE. Really what our foray or, or value offering to the market space is the fabrication and welding of the solid wall, the, uh, the whaleite and, and the panels into very unique configurations. And from those configurations, what Upanor has evolved over the um, past couple of years is our engineered solutions. Our engineered solutions, here's a, a couple of pictures of a couple of tanks, um, uh, either um, a barrel, square tanks, a geothermal vault. Um, the versatility and the design aspects, we have a 100-year design life of HDPE. Um, we work because of the fabrication, the abilities. We were into numerous markets such as stormwater, CSO, rainwater harvesting, pump stations, wastewater, anything that requires the conveyance, storage, or retention, detention of, of, of a liquid, we can design our systems and custom make it to whatever the engineer's requirements are. Here's a collage of, of a couple of examples of the fabrication abilities that we have. Uh, this is a uh, simple barrel design. Uh, here we have a manifold. This is typically a stormwater detention. Uh, increase in the barrels increases the capacity. Uh, an example of fabricating um, angles or um, fittings. Uh, here's a square. Uh, another one is a manifold design. Uh, to give you an example, of, again, with our fabrication facilities, again, uh, there's no uh, there's really nothing that we can't do, and what we say around our engineering is that we're limited by our imagination. Another collage showing a couple of examples of uh, the bending uh, radius ability uh, of the whaleite pipe. Uh, additional, uh, here's one of having a reducer, of, of taking a pipe and reducing it down using the uh, whaleite. Uh, here is a, uh, a manhole. Uh, or service entry. Uh, another one here is a uh, manifold configuration and you see a service ladder coming in here. So working with the engineers, again, there's the, the versatility and the flexibility within our designs, uh, just to give you an example of what our capabilities are. For one example, here is a, um, a, a retention. 
just a straight barrel design to show um, a straight uh, capped on both ends with a, with a service way. Uh, this is to, intended to be buried. Um, Another, if, if it made more, uh, uh, sometimes if the uh, space constraints um, are high, we need, we have a smaller footprint in which to uh, work with a uh, large volume. Square tanks is, are uh, an ideal solution uh, to that. Here we have a, I believe it's a 14 foot high by 14 foot uh, detention tank, about 56,000 gallons. And for this particular, we can see that we've, we've put flange fittings onto the front. Another uh, exploded isometric view. Uh, this is again to show our capabilities. Uh, uh, this is the stormwater, and you see this particular design, we've actually put baffles into it, which allows uh, the impact of particles, allows uh, a rapid, uh, more of a, a rapid settling rate of particles, so we have cleaner effluent coming through. And you see down here we have a tapered uh, area, so sedimentation and uh, particulate can be flushed out uh, by these uh, flush ports uh, at the very end very bottom. Another c configuration design, uh, this is a manifold, again, showing uh, the flexibility in our design and an option we can provide. Uh, this provide, in this particular one, the yellow, you can see that we've installed this that provides channelization uh, of low flows, uh, as well as um, here's an access point for the FRP ladders. Uh, this is a, um, um, a pump station. It's on a horizontal. This would be installed vertically, but here's an example of, a, of about a 10-foot um, diameter uh, pump station. And this particular, rather than a manhole, we've put actually a metal uh, surface entrance on there. And I think Brian will be getting into here, this uh, flat bottom right here. This is a um, uh, uh, anti-buoyancy uh, um, device. This is to show, again, different flexibility and configurations that we have. Uh, these are being uh, welded on site, uh, but here you can see here's a, a manway entrance uh, that's a little bit different. Rather than having a concrete configuration uh, or pour, this is a little bit more unique and allows, again, uh, smaller, uh, depending on the footprint, this allows us a more uh, um, a tighter, uh, tighter footprint and more accessibility, uh, uh, more variabilities in the accessibility of our systems. This particular example, this is, I, you know, this is a UV system, but it's to show the combination of, of uh, combining uh, the whale, uh, whale, uh, whale uh, pipe as well uh, into our, our whale panel to produce a, a UV system. But again, it's to show you the combinations of, of the two materials and, and the integration that we can provide. And from there, I'll turn it over to Brian. Well, thanks, Brian. I appreciate that. Um, so what we're going to do now is, after we've had a, a brief overview of the material, its capabilities, we're going to cover um, uh, how the material, both in round and rectangular form, can be used uh, to provide solutions for both combined sewer overflow and stormwater detention and retention structures. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, discussing some applications and configurations, and then we'll cover uh, some of the design uh, and technical aspects of the system. Um, but basically, wheelite and wheelite modular rectangular units can be utilized to provide uh, solutions for combined sewer overflow, um, wet weather facilities, peak flow attenuation, uh, vertical pump stations, and manhole applications. And as Grant mentioned, our uh, resist, resistance of the material to hydrogen sulfide, pH, deterioration, and corrosion makes it an ideal solution for uh, wastewater applications and combined sewer overflow projects. Uh, we also uh, can produce large-scale stormwater management facilities uh, with both round and rectangular uh, systems. Uh, detention, where uh, we're not allowed to leak or infiltrate water, uh, similar to combined sewer overflow or retention, where we're actually trying to accomplish infiltration. Uh, we can also manufacture outlet control structures, junctions, uh, and internal baffle walls to uh, uh, promote TSS debris, uh, trash debris, and uh, uh, other contaminant um, removal. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, we have two solutions, and Grant kind of covered this. We have the wheelite large diameter round uh, storage structures where we could produce manifolds in up to 132 inches or 11 foot diameter. We're one of the few manufacturers in the world that can produce detention and retention structures of this uh, scale. 
Uh, and depending upon diameter, soil condition, and water table, we can accomplish depths of up to 50 feet. Um, so that should uh, give us an understanding of the robust nature of this material and its ability to be used in a wide array of applications. Large diameter, uh, deep structures, incredibly strong. Um, and again, we can accomplish inlet-outlet configurations, control structures. Uh, for detention projects or CSO projects, we would utilize a field-welded joint, and we'll cover that in a little bit more detail. For retention structures, we have a threaded joint, and we'll review that as well briefly. Um, on the round side, we have um, you know, what most people would consider as a round storage option, which would be a single tank. And, and these next few slides kind of demonstrate some configurations that we could accommodate. Uh, but because of the versatility of the material, we can essentially produce uh, almost any layout configuration necessary to support uh, large volumes of storage uh, given the existing site conditions. Uh, and this is the beginning of what one would see as a simple uh, singular tank. Uh, one single 11-foot diameter tank, about 50 foot long, would be the limit on what we could ship to the project in a single load, uh, and that can provide about 35,000 gallons of storage. However, if we require additional storage, uh, we can connect those systems in the field, uh, either end-to-end -end using extrusion welding in the field, which we'll cover, um, or with a large diameter or small diameter manifold header systems at the ends to uh, connect them hydraulically. Uh, again, this just kind of reinforces that infinite configuration of large diameter round storage structures. Here you can see on the left-hand side of the slide we have what is referred to as a large diameter uh, header or manifold. Um, there's also the option to do bulkheads, and you'll see in some photos, uh, to do a bulkhead end and then connect those sections using a smaller diameter pipe, and that tends to be the more cost-effective approach uh, from a material and fabrication standpoint, to use smaller diameter headers as opposed to larger. But occasionally site conditions, layout configurations require that we squeeze a little bit more storage in the end of the structure, and we can do that with a large diameter header, as you see there. Uh, here's just another example of the infinite configura configurations we can provide. This is just a simple uh, three-barrel manifold system. Uh, and then, obviously, that can grow uh, to accomplish whatever you require for your given site. If you have a rock bearing or water table issues, you want to keep the system up high, uh, we can uh, lay the structure out to accommodate whatever volume of storage required. Uh, we could also do manhole risers. Uh, to provide access throughout the structure. We'll cover manholes in a little bit. So that should give you a brief snapshot of the wheel light detention structures from a round perspective. Uh, but what most people aren't familiar with is our ability to produce modular rectangular storage units. Um, our development of this product uh, began and well, actually was was available to the market space in about 2013, and we've been developing this technology over the years uh, to bring it to the market space and have it available for stormwater and CSO applications. Um, what we can do is we can manufacture extremely large rectangular units. Uh, the largest we can ship is about 49 feet long uh, by 12 feet high and 12 feet wide, providing about 53,000 gallons of storage per single unit. Uh, if we need more storage, just like the round, we can connect those units hydraulically uh, with pipes uh, and extrusion weld them in the field to ensure we have a complete watertight system. Uh, this is unique and, and previously unavailable. Prior to the development of wheel light modular, uh, the industry was left with structures like this had to be concrete um, just because of the, the volume of storage and size. Um, however, those concrete structures would be cast in place in the field uh, due to the weight and uh, difficulty handling and shipping structures of that magnitude. Uh, because we are one-tenth the weight of concrete, we can now produce extremely large rectangular structures, much lighter than concrete, uh, with a 100-year design life, immune to hydrogen sulfide, deterioration, corrosion, uh, and they are um, you know, a system that is extremely versatile and can be designed to uh, meet your site conditions and provide the volume of storage that's required. Here's a couple of examples of how that rectangular configuration could be expanded, uh, providing in this particular example nine units uh, to achieve a volume of storage for a particular CSO application. And this uh, obviously is just one example, and we can expand upon that. Here you see a photo of a, a, a dual uh, structure system that's being shipped out to the field. Uh, those two units would be end-to-end -end connected and we provide an inside and outside fusion well to connect the two structures to provide one continuous rectangular storage structure in the field using the wheel light modular application. 
Uh, but that's not the limit of it for storage. Uh, anything that you can think of that you would have approached with concrete, steel, fiberglass, rectangular structure, we can now manufacture out of wheelite modular. Uh, when design loads require, whether it's airport loading, CL625, HS20, uh, we can reinforce the annular space uh, to accommodate those loadings and ensure that the structure is within allowable structural tolerances or max deflection. Uh, so, again, if you can think of a, a project that would be a, a large rectangular structure, the chances are we can manufacture it out of wheelite modular. Uh, both round and rectangular options, um, whether you're wheelite round or wheelite modular, uh, can be uh, uh, fabricated with internal controls, baffle walls to encourage TSS removal or particulate separation. Uh, we can also provide energy dissipation uh, inside the structure, and we can do outlet control. So if you're in stormwater situation, you want to provide peak flow attenuation, low flow, mid flow weir controls in a wall, uh, you no longer have to build an independent rectangular concrete structure. You can do all that inside your detention structure uh, and do so much more cost effectively uh, with wheel lights capabilities. Um, so we mentioned the, a few joint configurations. Uh, for, we have basically threaded, uh, which is a soil-tight joint, and then we have welded, um, which can uh, achieve pressures up to 22.5 PSI, and we'll talk a little bit about each one of those independently. Um, our threaded soil-tight joint um, was originally developed for culvert reline applications where they're going to grout the annular space around the structure. We do quite a bit of culvert reline projects. Um, however, it also is functional for retention applications uh, where we're allowed to infiltrate and we're going to design a system that has a clean graded aggregate backfill around it, surrounded by a geotextile fabric. We want to store water in the detention structure, but we also want it to infiltrate, um, and the soil tight joint can be utilized, and the threaded joint can be utilized in that configuration. However, if you're in a wastewater application or a detention application where you don't necessarily want to infiltrate, uh, you're going to go with a field welded joint. Um, and we have a number of different uh, joint configurations depending on your application and the pressure requirements, essentially. Uh, we can start with a single wall, uh, ID or OD, which is where we'll either weld, where the, the pipes come together, we'll either weld the inside of the pipe or the outside only. Uh, and that gets us to about 5 PSI with standard wheel light. Uh, we can do an inside diameter and outside diameter weld, do both welds, uh, and that's going to get us to about 10 PSI um, with standard wheel light. If we want to achieve higher pressures, we have a product called Wheel Light LP, with, which essentially is a slight modification to the extrusion process where we would smooth the uh, weld, uh, the profile to profile weld or annular uh, section to section weld. Uh, to achieve a 15 PSI. With that pipe, we would also have what's referred to as full penetration weld, um, where we have a mechanical welder uh, that, that goes out to the project site and uh, welds the two materials together to ensure we have a full penetration weld. Uh, we also have Wheelite LP 1.5 that in combination with our mobile welder uh, can achieve a 22.5 PSI. Uh, and there are obvious uh, costs associated with each one of these ratcheting up in uh, pressure uh, capabilities, um, and we would take a look at that with you uh, when we work through a project to determine what the requirements are and what was necessary, and then develop a specification that, that met your requirements. Uh, here's a snapshot of an extrusion welder, and we'll talk a little bit about extrusion welding, but an uh, extrusion welding technician doing an inside diameter extrusion weld. On the right-hand side, what you see on the left-hand side is our coupler. Uh, that's a temporary band that holds the pipes together in the field while we do the extrusion welding. So basically we do a butt end connection, uh, lock the two pipes together, and then do an extrusion weld in the field, and then that coupler can be removed because it is not necessary after the weld is in place. Um, you know, one thing on, on, on both stormwater uh, and combined sewer overflow projects and just regular projects in general that are conveyance, we do quite a bit of. Uh, we do manholes. Uh, the nice thing about our, our capabilities in manholes is that we're able to produce extremely large, complex uh, geometries. You can see on the bottom right-hand side there, we have a fairly complex junction structure uh, that to produce that in concrete would be extremely difficult. 
Uh, however, because of the versatility of polyethylene and the wheel light material, we're able to produce uh, very complex, large diameter junction structures efficiently. Uh, and again, uh, you know, as Grant mentioned, immune hydrogen sulfide deterioration, pH, and corrosion. This next slide just shows some of the junction capabilities. And again, we can produce junctions of this uh, geometry and others in large diameter up to 11 foot diameter. Uh, we also do pump station wet wells. Uh, duplex submersible pump stations. Uh, actually, this, what you see here on this isometric is an example of a quad pump station or quadplex, if that is even a, a word, uh, submersible pump station um, on the right-hand side where we'll actually fabricate all the internal piping components. Uh, base elbows are prefabricated into the system. And all that has to happen um, once the, the system is delivered to the project location is the, uh, the pumps, uh, submersible pumps are slid down on their guide rails and locked into place. Uh, the uh, exterior piping is connected. It's wired to the control panel and backfilled, and, and they're ready to go. Uh, so it significantly reduces the time and cost of installation. And pump station uh, wet wells, we can manufacture up to about 50 foot in depth and 11 foot diameter, uh, complete polyethylene pump station that, again, is immune hydrogen sulfide pH corrosion deterioration. Uh, and we, we find that this is resonating uh, quite loudly with our public service districts and municipalities who are faced with replacing concrete pump stations and manholes uh, that have deteriorated well in advance of their uh, expected design life. Uh, so we can produce pump station wet wells as well. Uh, one thing to note with our pump stations, it's an important uh, thing that comes up, and we get the question from time to time, is you would expect if I have extremely large pumps, uh, high horsepower pumps, uh, that are anchored into polyethylene that are uh, rocking on and off and have vibratory loads. Uh, we want to counteract those vibratory loads and that thrust of the pump uh, with a uh, concrete base. So what we do is we actually will, will uh, encapsulate a rebar reinforced concrete base into the system. We'll drop our anchor bolts in um, to support the breakaway fittings uh, and we'll ship the uh, system out to the job site with a, pre a cast in place fully HDPE encapsulated base uh, that will resist the vibratory loads of the pump and ensure the system will last 100 years uh, that we want it to. And the next slide is just a, an example of that fabrication with a finished product on the right-hand side with a simplex submersible breakaway fitting that's anchored. As you can see there, the concrete's being cast, the anchor bolts are set into the concrete, uh, and the system is actually fully encapsulated in HDPE. So we still get a 100% HDPE vessel uh, but we do have that concrete vibratory load resistance cast into the bottom of the structure. And that concrete, uh, in, in case anybody's wondering, is typically sized to four times the pump weight as a standard in accordance with AWWA. Um, so now that I briefly covered some stormwater and CSO configurations from a detention, rectangular and round application, um, I'd like to briefly cover some technical considerations related to these systems. As this is a technical webinar, we want to cover some of the critical components uh, related to the, the design and manufacture of these systems. And probably the biggest one to cover is the, just some fundamentals regarding uh, thermoplastic welding and fabrication. Um, it's important for us to get an understanding of the, uh, the nature of thermoplastic welding and fabrication and also some of the quality control standards that are in place. So for those that aren't familiar, thermoplastic fusion welding or fusion and extrusion welding uh, should not be con confused with uh, techniques such as gluing, soldering, or brazing, which do not ultimately melt the base material um, and, and have a seam or a, a weakness in the joint between the two, the two materials. Conversely, extrusion welding heats all three materials, base A, base B, and the filler material to prescribed temperature based on uh, material thickness and type. Uh, to create a homogeneous uh, weld pool where we encourage molecular alignment across that seam. And as we see, we'll see in a second here when we talk about material testing, um, the weld seam is actually the strongest part of the section. Um, the weld seam will have uh, more material, will be a thicker section, and when we run it through tensile strength testing, our expectation is that the, uh, the other material, either the A or B materials in the system will fail and not the weld itself. So with this, we're able to create a, a huge array and an infinite uh, configuration uh, of different types of systems um, by use of extrusion welding and polyethylene. Much like you can think of, we can weld almost anything and create almost anything out of steel. 
Uh, the same would apply to polyethylene, where we can create almost anything out of polyethylene using thermoplastic fusion welding. Um, here's a snapshot of an extrusion welding gun being utilized. Uh, just the concept is essentially we apply a granulate funnel or wire reel feed of polyethylene through a small extrusion chamber in, in the gun. Uh, that heats that. Uh, simultaneously, hot gas or air is fed through the, the unit uh, to heat the base materials A and B to the prescribed temperature. And then we have a welding shoe, uh, which is actually pre-designed um, for the project based on the joint configuration and the stress and strain that we're going to apply to that joint. There are standards and quality control procedures uh, to ensure that we have the right geometry for the loads that are going to be applied to that. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, when we cover finite element analysis modeling. Uh, here's a, just a photo for those that are not familiar with extrusion welding. Uh, as you can see, these uh, guns are quite large, um, sometimes 40, 50 pounds, uh, and operator fatigue can come into play, and also the quality of, of quality control and training of the operator uh, is critical to ensure we have a high-quality product delivered to the project site. Uh, this is just a snapshot uh, from the fundamentals of thermoplastic fusion welding uh, that kind of speaks to uh, the critical nature of operator training and quality control procedures, um, the temperature of the nozzle, the base material, preparation of the joint, uh, the amount of pressure applied to the, to the system, uh, and also the rate at which material is being applied are critical operator-dependent uh, elements. So um, we, we talk about this because it's important to note that anyone can buy an extrusion welding gun uh, and, and weld something in their garage. However, it's very important uh, for engineered systems uh, that need to last 100 years uh, to have a, a rigid quality control certification and training program in place for that operator. Uh, OpenOr adheres to DVS uh, welding standards. Our operators are DVS certified. Um, and uh, that is the oldest, I guess, most stringent uh, welding standard that's been around for a while. But there's also AWS B2.4 2012 and uh, OpenOr falls under B2.4's guidelines as well. So there are those two standards in play uh, throughout North America and the world, and it's important for any company that's manufacturing polyethylene systems to adhere to at least one, if not both, of those standards. Additional standards, uh, as you might expect, would be ASTM standards. We're not going to go through this list, but we will cover some of these in a little bit here when we talk about underground installation. Um, and also um, acceptance testing for a drawdown in a second. Uh, but it's important to note that there are extensive ASTM standards in place uh, that would govern the design, fabrication, and installation of any thermoplastic welded system. Uh, and when we work with an engineer or client uh, to develop a, a system and specification, uh, we will prepare uh, the relevant ASTM specifications and ensure that the project meets that. So after we have extensive quality control testing, uh, certification of our welding technician, uh, and a quality control plan in place, we also have to uh, have quality assurance testing. And the three lines of defense for quality assurance are visual pressure testing and internal leak testing, or exfil, infill testing, as we refer to it. Uh, as one might expect, just like steel welding, first line of defense is visual inspection. Uh, this is where we're going to look for a heat-affected zone or a dull-appearing haze. Uh, that follows the weld. So we're looking for a consistent dull appearing haze to follow the weld gun. If we see shiny splashes of material or inconsistency in that haze, uh, we have a problem. We either need to test that section or remove that weld, regrind it, and reproduce it. So when you look at a polyethylene weld, you're going to want to look for a dull appearing haze to follow that weld seam. Uh, the other line of defense, which we'll talk about here in a second, is pressure testing of the internal voids. Uh, this is actually unique to Wheelite in that we um, have an annular space that is generally continuous throughout the structure, and when we break that annular space with a penetration, a pipe penetration or something else, uh, we can actually test across that penetration by pressurizing the annular space, and we'll show you some photos there. Uh, we also frequently are asked, especially on combined sewer projects, to develop uh, infield leak testing and acceptance pr programs. Uh, this is an important thing for us to identify early in the project that there's going to be a 24-hour drawdown or infill, exfill test uh, to develop the specification for that project to ensure uh, that when we go out into the field to test this, uh, this application for, for leakage, it's done correctly. 
and we'll work with with folks to do that. But it is very common for us to have to uh, conduct 24-hour drawdown infill or exfill testing in the field, and that is governed by 2487. Here's a photo of our pressure test. Uh, before any structure leaves the field or even in the field, if we're doing uh, welding in the field, uh, we can pressurize that annular space, as you see there, to ensure it holds uh, pressure. Uh, and it's a great quality control check uh, that is actually exclusive to the wheel light profile uh, and gives us a, an advantage in, in, in fabrication and delivery of a watertight system. That is something we do very frequently and part of our quality control plan. Um, so now that we've talked about a little bit about thermoplastic fusion welding, I'd like to cover pipe and vessel design. Uh, engineers and clients should be familiar uh, with pipe and vessel design, where it comes from. We don't have a lot of time to cover this at length, uh, but this is just a familiarization. Um, where Wheelite is concerned, we're, we're uh, concerned with ASTM F894, uh, and that's where we describe the stiffness of the material as a ring stiffness constant. Uh, and some might be familiar with solid wall pipe, where we describe the stiffness of the material as a pipe stiffness. Um, they're interchanged uh, inaccurately quite frequently. They are different. Uh, so solid wall pipe refers to a pipe stiffness, uh, which is described as a, a prescribed deflection position at a prescribed speed on a prescribed sample length. Uh, and then we have ring stiffness constant, which is really weighted for size. Uh, and the ring stiffness constant is uh, deflection divided as a percent based on the sample length in feet. Uh, slight nuances or differences between the two, um, but we should be familiar that the two are different. Uh, and as one might expect, the two uh, pipe stiffness, PS, and ring stiffness constant, RSC, can be related. Uh, and the basic equation, as you can see there, is equation X1.2, which basically relates a, a load times uh, over a travel uh, times a sample length, as you can see there's the basic equation. Um, but all pipe design is in accordance with PPI, Plastic Pipe Institute Chapter 6, for solid wall and wheelite. Uh, and as you can see there, uh, the deflection and uh, performance of that pipe buckling strain, they're all based on Spangler's modified Iowa formula, as you can see there. Um, and I encourage everyone uh, to uh, visit Plastic Pipe Institute if they'd like to understand a little bit more about pipe design uh, for both structural profile wall, F894 pipe, and solid wall pipe. You can visit uh, PPI's website, and they have an excellent resource there, and uh, particularly Chapter 6 uh, of PPI would be that that governs this. And this applies to horizontal pipe configurations. Um, in lieu of everyone becoming an expert on plastic pipe design, we've actually developed a very handy uh, design calculator online uh, that will calculate uh, buckling, strain, deflection of any horizontal pipe system. Um, you can just simply input some parameters uh, for the project into uh, the Berry Pipe Design Calculator, either for solid wall or structural profile wall wheel light, as you can see there. Uh, here's just a snapshot of the output that tool provides. Um, and you're free to use this, uh, log in and use it at, at, at your leisure. Uh, alternatively, you can contact us uh, and we'll be happy to run that for you for any given project. Uh, but pipe and vessel design and rectangular structure design is all based upon some material testing. Uh, Upanor is one of the few companies in the world that has run full-scale deflection testing on all its diameters for all its pipe. Uh, we have a full-scale deflection testing facility in our Huntsville location where we'll actually test our pipe and we have NSF testing. So that deflection testing is actually the basis of our design and a very important for any manufacturer that produces polyethylene pipes, whether it's structural profile wall or solid wall, uh, to be able to show that their deflection testing of their material uh, meets the ASTM uh, and their design uh, is in line with that empirical data. We also, as I mentioned earlier, conduct tensile strength testing or destructive testing on our systems where we'll put the system under load, in this particular case 2,900 PSI in a tensile load, uh, and as we would expect, we would see the failure of the material uh, in the profile itself, not in the weld seam, and that's what you see in this particular photo. Uh, on the photo on the left, you can see we've taken a coupon sample, put it in the tensile strength machine, uh, you can see the weld on the top and the weld on the bottom, and as we would expect on the photo on the right, it is the profile between the two welds that fails under load, which is what we want. We want to ensure that that weld seam is the strongest part of the section. Uh, and then for any given project, as part of our quality control and quality assurance program, we can provide 
a sample to our clients to demonstrate that the material met standards uh, and provide a, a report and, and actually provide the samples if they so desire on any given project to just reinforce that. So that was a little bit about pipe and vessel design. Um, but, you know, that's for horizontal pipes. Uh, any pipe or horizontal vessel, whether it's a CSO storage structure that's run in a horizontal condition, uh, the deflection buckling of the system can be designed uh, around pipe and vessel design in accordance with PPI. However, when we start to penetrate the structure or build baffle walls, put manholes in it, uh, bulkheads, or do anything that, it, that goes beyond pipe and vessel design, we need to conduct a finite element structural analysis. So again, as I said, bulkheads, risers, penetrations, uh, these don't fall under pipe and vessel design, and they need to be looked at carefully in the design of a structure. Uh, there's two ways to do this with finite element, and we will employ both from time to time depending on the application. Uh, the first is CANDI finite element analysis, uh, which is a FEA program that does a 2D caner, uh, sorry, a 2D planer slice through the structure to model the backfill, the structure itself, uh, and also the vehicular loads, if any, applied to the structure to determine the deflection of the system. We'll show you some photos there. We also conduct a three-dimensional either ANSYS or INVENTOR finite element analysis that will actually model the structure in 3D uh, in, in many nodes, and we can apply loads to that. And so I'll show you some examples of that work. Um, so you can see here's a, a bulkhead that has a pipe penetration. That would not fall under pipe and vessel design. So in order for us to ensure that's going to meet allowable deflection uh, and, and the, the loads that are applied to it, we have to model that in, in our 3D FEA, and then we can determine the deflection of the material. If that deflection exceeds allowable tolerance in the range of L over 1,000, uh, we can reinforce the annular space in the, in the system, or we can provide additional external reinforcing. As you can see on the bottom right of photo right, we actually ran a profile, and we can put steel inside that if necessary uh, to improve the, uh, the strength of the system when, when it's required. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, candy. FEA is a 2D slice. I'm sorry, Candy 2D FEA is a two-dimensional slice. As you can see in these photos, we model the subgrade, we model the non-critical backfill zone in the the the, uh, or the photo on the top is uh, the yellow area and what we refer to as the non-critical backfill zone, and then we have the CBZ, which is the critical backfill zone, uh, and then we can apply loads to the system and determine the deflection of the structure. So these are some tools that we have to take. Uh, our systems beyond pipe and vessel design and ensure that the structure is going to meet our design requirements. So uh, one question that comes up frequently is, um, okay, so wheelite and wheelite modular systems are one-tenth the weight of concrete. How do you guys counteract buoyancy? Uh, is buoyancy a concern? Uh, and the answer to that is it's, it's fairly simple. Uh, we design all of our systems assuming a submerged condition or the vessel is fully submerged in the field. Uh, that's the most conservative approach, but we find that it gives us a, a, a sense of uh, calm in the face of uncertain groundwater table information. Uh, typically, we have seasonal high groundwater issues, uh, and it's often hard to pin down the groundwater table. Uh, so we find that it's best to approach the design assuming a fully submerged condition. Uh, and then we can rely on the soil column around the structure or above it uh, to provide additional buoyancy anchor. Uh, for vertical applications, we would extend the base plate to capture more soil column and can do that up to a 14-foot shipping width. And then for horizontal systems, we rely on a strap and anchor system. It's fairly straightforward. Um, for those that aren't familiar with buoyancy, um, buoyancy is calculated based on the volume of displaced water, which is uh, the, basically the volume of the vessel times the specific weight of water, or 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. Uh, and then we basically have the weight of the structure is the, the, the force down, and then we also have the soil columns load on the horizontal projection. For vertical vessels, you can see there on the isometric on the left, we would extend that base plate to capture more soil column up to a 14-foot width. Um, when that 14-foot width is exceeded, we can't ship that efficiently. We would just cast a simple concrete collar around the base, as you can see there on the bottom right. Uh, to ensure that we, we had sufficient horizontal projection under the soil column. Uh, we also have a handy design calculator, as you can see there, that we're happy to run for you or share to quickly determine the necessary buoyancy countermeasure for any application. 
For horizontal, as I said earlier, we would rely on a strap and anchor system, the same principle as vertical, where we're trying to increase the horizontal projection under the soil column and then transfer the vertical force upwards and from buoyancy from the system through a strap to the anchors, as you see there. Uh, we also have a prefabricated uh, system for buoyancy that can be shipped to the project site where we'll actually use a wheel-like pipe, fill it with concrete and rebar, and ship it out to the project along with the system, and the contractor can easily set that adjacent to the structure to counteract buoyancy. And all of these particular buoyancy countermeasures will be designed custom for any project, and we're happy to help you through with that. Um, so before we get into a couple project profiles quickly, I just want to discuss backfill standards. Um, buried pipe structure design, these, these are flexible conduit structures that are um, basically soil structure interaction systems uh, that rely on high quality backfill compacted to 90% 90, 90 modified proctor uh, in uniform lifts on both sides. Most folks know that, uh, but it's important to talk about the, the standards related uh, to that. And the primary standard that we would adhere to would be ASTM D2321. Uh, this particular standard defines material gradation, uh, placement, and compaction of material around any polyethylene structure. It also defines uh, acceptable subgrade parameters. Um, when we have all those parameters, we, we, can, we can accommodate uh, the project by simply adhering to ASTM D2321. If the project doesn't have those or we're not capable of achieving um, that, we can actually run the actual project profile parameters in our candy analysis and determine whether the actual subgrade condition or backfill available for the project would meet uh, our design criteria. But our first line of defense is to simply adhere to ASTM D2321. If we're not able to achieve that, then we would have to run a candy analysis to confirm performance of the system. Um, so ASTM 2321 defines, again, as I was talking about earlier in the candy analysis, uh, defines a critical backfill zone A. Uh, non-critical, select backfill zone B, subgrade, and then the surface above the structure. Uh, that same consideration in a rectangular form would be the same. And what it does is in that zone A, it defines a critical backfill material, which is really a class A1 or A3, if you're familiar with the AASHTO soil groups, or a class 1, class 2 material. So that's a high-quality, well-graded material, placed and compacted in uniform lifts, uh, and to a modified 90% proctor. Uh, in the zone B outside, we're, we're a little bit more forgiving, and again, that's on the outside of that critical backfill zone. Uh, we, we were allowing other materials. We're even allowing a little bit of clays or CLML materials. Uh, as long as they're compacted to 90% proctor, we're in good shape. So ASDM, I won't, I won't read this eye chart, but it does define those materials a little bit more. Uh, and this is the basis of our backfill specifications that we develop for any project. Uh, so some key points on backfill before we cover project profiles briefly um, are that essentially, you know, the soil bearing, native bedding of the surrounding subgrade needs to be about 2,000 net allowable, uh, 2,000 PSF net allowable. If we can't achieve that, um, then we need to know that and either provide recommendations uh, for geotextile uh, gravel improvement to the subgrade um, or we can account for that uh, lower net allowable bearing of, of, the, of the existing soils in our candy analysis and determine whether or not it's acceptable. Uh, frequently, design engineers don't really have good information for the net allowable bearing or the existing subgrade bearing uh, for any given project. So the specification would call out to uh, have that, but also identify that the geotechnical engineer of record, quality control inspector, uh, should uh, confirm that a 2,000 net allowable is achieved once they open up the excavation. The next two points are important in that we want to make sure that the backfill proposed and delivered to the project meets the requirements of 2321. Uh, occasionally, we run into projects where alternate materials are substituted for backfill, either inadvertently or on purpose, uh, and that's not a good thing because the system is designed assuming certain backfill requirements uh, so if we're going to deviate, we need to know about that and account for that in the design. Uh, secondly, it's important to know that we need to place and compact the backfill in accordance with 2321, which is very simply uniform lifts on both sides compacted to 90%. Um, and so as you can see there on the bottom photos there, we have a system on the left that's been installed correctly, excellent subgrade preparation. Um, and we have a, another system in the middle where you can see them bringing the, the backfill up in uniform lifts uh, on both sides. 
And then we have the photo on the right, um, which they don't have the acceptable amount of space outside the structure to um, compact uh, that, that material, and they're also not bringing it up in uniform lifts. They're simply dumping that material around the structure, which is a no-no. Uh, so, you know, we want to develop quality control standards uh, to set it up such that the project is installed correctly, it uses the correct material, and it's brought in in even lifts uh, to ensure that it, it lasts the design life of the system. So uh, a couple minutes left here. I will cover some project profiles. This is the, the more interesting part of this presentation. Uh, the first project I'd like to talk about, we're very excited about, uh, we just closed this one out, is the Santa Gas Combined Sewer Overflow Project. Uh, this project utilized multiple diameters uh, to achieve uh, 260,000 gallons of storage uh, in a manifold-type configuration. We used, uh, I would say, medium-diameter manifold header system, a 36-inch manifold system at the header of the structure. And then we were able to accommodate the existing site layout and also um, the geotechnical considerations for rock bearing and excavation limitations uh, to, to get the layout and get the volume of storage required to provide CSO overflow mitigation uh, for this particular project in Quebec. Uh, just shows you the, our ability to uh, modify and configure our system to meet any project's requirements. Here's a snapshot of that project going in. As you can see there on the bottom right-hand photo, there's the, uh, the header openings that would be connected to um, what is shown right above it, the 36-inch uh, header system is actually manufactured out of solid wall sclare pipe, uh, and that's actually systems on its side. What you see there is the riser or access uh, riser, and then the header systems are the smaller stubs coming off of that. Uh, we would also have access ladders inside the structure to encourage access, and then that uh, riser could also be extended uh, vertically uh, by welding another section on top of it to extend it to grade. That's just an example of, of a large diameter detention structure for a CSO application. Another project we recently closed was the L.A. County uh, Federal Courthouse. This one was very interesting. This was a rainwater harvest and reuse application for 106,000 gallons. The big challenge on this project, it was immediately adjacent to a roadway and the building, uh, and we had to design the structure to remain outside of the zone of influence of the structural footings, uh, which we were able to do. As you can see in that configuration, this is a, a photo of the installation. Um, here you can see an actual isometric of the structure. This was actually four 11-foot uh, diameter sections that were delivered to the project and then uh, field extrusion welded to create a 100% watertight system. On this project, it's also interesting to note that we provided a submersible pump station or a standalone vertical submersible pump station uh, to uh, remove the uh, submergence depth requirement for the pumps from the vessel itself. And this is a more efficient design because uh, the particular pumps for this project had about a 1.5-foot submergence depth, uh, which is basically um, inactive hydraulic storage that can't be utilized. So we want to bring that outside the system to get the most storage inside the vessel as possible and minimize the footprint of the project. Here's a couple of snapshots of some internal components. We showed you some of these photos earlier, these isometrics. Uh, that uh, The isometric on the left-hand side is the submersible wet well itself, and the other photos are, are internal controls for energy dissipation, drawdown, uh, and TSS removal to encourage uh, high quality of water. Uh, this is a CSO storage structure, 60-inch wheelite system where we actually connected these structures to concrete systems. Um, it's important to note that, you know, we could also do these header uh, manhole structures uh, in polyethylene as well. Larger diameter structure here, uh, the Hall Crescent CSO project. Um, we used a 120-inch wheel light that was field welded, and we had 200, uh, about 250 linear feet per barrel. So it's continuous 250 linear foot run of 120-inch wheel light uh, with field welded joints that had to pass a 24-hour drawdown test for uh, infiltration and exfiltration. Uh, example of a manhole project we produced, we produced 16 manholes for the Denver airport. These were replacement manholes replacing concrete structures that had deteriorated due to H2S and glycol. Uh, and then these, these particular manholes were fabricated to accommodate uh, aircraft loading as well. As you can see, we have a top riser that extends on top of these structures would be a cast-in-place rebar reinforced load relief slab uh, to mitigate the high uh, wheel loads of the aircraft um, and distribute those loads to the soil. And that's something we can do on any project to accommodate the vehicular or aircraft loading uh, with a load relief slab above the structure, standard design practice. 
Uh, another uh, stormwater project here, this is a 350,000 gallon storage structures of 120 inch wheelite just to kind of demonstrate uh, our capabilities and uh, the size and magnitude of, of storage structures that we can provide. Um, this, we, we talked a little bit about this earlier. This is a UV, uh, potable water UV contact system. It's an above ground structure. Uh, horizontal pipes uh, need to have harsh support when they're full of water. So we combine the wheelite panel and wheelite vessel uh, to create an above ground system uh, to accommodate UV contact in a potable water facility. So it's just an example of the versatility of the material and our ability to provide a solution for any given project. Uh, we talked a little bit about this one earlier. This is uh, just an example of how we can provide large diameter manholes, junctions, and, um, and we can just move forward from there. And the last project before we terminate here and go to question and answer uh, is basically um, a, uh, a stormwater overflow project where we had an inline stormwater detention structure. Uh, we removed the existing small diameter pipe and replaced it with a large diameter structure and outlet control uh, to provide stormwater relief uh, in line with the existing storm drain. Also important to note that we provided both RCP and PVC dissimilar material connections uh, into the structure. And so that is the last project profile I have. And with that, if there are any questions, we can jump right into them. Thank you very, very, very much, Brian. That was fantastic, and thank you, Grant, as well. Um, as Brian said, this is the question and answer portion. We are coming to the top of the hour, though, and we understand uh, people's time constraints. So we're going to keep this section pretty brief, but I do want to remind folks that if you do have a question you want to ask and you haven't had an opportunity to do so, you can still do that. Um, there's a Q&A widget at the bottom of your console. If we don't get to your question now, the presenters will receive those and they'll be able to answer you offline. So, But before we let you go, let's try to tackle just a couple of questions here. Um, we have one uh, viewer that's asking, can this be applicable to a leachate storage tank as an alternative to glass-fused steel tank? Um, and they suggest dimensions of approximately 10 meters high, 20 meters in diameter. What do you think about that? Uh, uh, I'll take oh. You're going to take that? Uh, okay. Sure. Well, uh, HTP is very inert material. Um, just uh, a comparison to that, when we do uh, wastewater treatment uh, facilities uh, where they may be hitting it may be a membrane um, uh, environment where they're hitting it with about a 2 pH to a 12 pH, hit it with chlorine, uh, hit it with uh, surfactant, so very numerous chemicals. We've never had an issue with that. When it comes to leachate, again, because it's a landfill, different materials, um, yes, the HDP material be very inert, and we have used uh, HDP tanks as well as the Waylight piping for conveyance uh, within leachate. So we have um, a lot of practical experience and case histories which we can draw from. So the answer is yes, you can. Terrific. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and then one more quick question before we wrap up today. Um, how is the long-term deflection of HDPE Waylight structures handled in design? Want me to do that one, Grant? No, <laughs> you got that one. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, long-term deflection and or long-term applied load is actually part of the PPI design. Uh, so when we put in um, the loading on the structure into PPI design, we actually enter in the design life or the duration of that applied load. Uh, so we actually design the structure to withstand a 100-year applied continuous load duration of that material, and then we use PPI, and this is for horizontal vessels. Uh, and then uh, when we, we run a candy analysis, we account for the amount of load applied to the structure, and then use the same material properties that Grant mentioned earlier in evaluation of that load and the total deflection, strain, moment, and shear on the structure, and account for that in our design process as well. And that's all part of the design calculations package that we typically prepare as part of our submittal process, whether it's horizontal pipe, baffle walls, bulkheads, or wheel light modular, that is accounted for and in accordance with PPI. 
All right, terrific. Brian, thank you very much. With that, um, I'm going to have to wrap up now. And um, so on behalf of Waterworld and Penwell Corporation, I just want to thank today's speakers, Grant Thornley and Brian McGuire, as well as our sponsor, Upanor Infra, for today's presentation. Put a dent in your CSO event using structural HDPE. Um, just one more quick reminder, today's presentation will be archived within 24 hours, and it can be accessed from the homepage at waterworld.com. And a reminder email message will also be sent out to all registrants with a direct link to that archive. We want to thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to serving you with future webcasts. And with that, this concludes today's presentation. Thank you all for participating.